Has anyone ever looked at you and said, where are you from? What country are you from? Did you want to hide the fact that maybe you were a Native American? Maybe you were Hispanic? Maybe you were in a Jewish community and you were German? Do you realize how often the Jews have tried to hide the fact that they are Jews? And yet there is a day coming when they're going to wear their Jewishness with a badge of honor. We'll talk about it today. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I'm in a wheelchair and I can roll back and forth. Now, when I've taught the other programs this week, I've been sitting in a chair and totally immobilized. Why did I move to a wheelchair? Why have I got all this wood on the table? And why have I got a carving tool like this knife? Well, you're going to find out why as we do our program today. And I pray that it will give you a visual that you won't forget and that God would use in your life anytime you're tempted to think about worshiping something else other than God or put someone else in the place of God. Well, beloved, we've come to Isaiah chapter 44, our final chapter for this week. Remember in 43, his last words were, I'm going to assign Jacob to the band and Israel to revilement. But then he says, but now listen, listen. He says, oh, Jacob, my servant, I'm going to assign you to the band. I'm going to put you up for revilement. But listen to me, my servant. Israel, whom I have chosen. How many times has he said, I have chosen you? He wants them to remember that their salvation, even the fact that they have become a Jew, is not because of their choosing or their design, but because of God's plan. He goes on to say, thus said the Lord who made you. Now remember, we have a free downloadable study guide for you so that you can discover truth for yourself, so that you can study with us through different books of the Bible. You can get that free study guide by going to preceptsforlife.com, preceptsforlife.com, or by going to the phone and picking up the number that we are going to give you. Now, as you look at this, I want you to see that one of the things that we would tell you is mark every reference to Jacob. So what I do is when I see Jacob, first of all, I put a star of David over him. So he says, thus says the Lord who made you, made you Jacob and formed you, you Jacob from the womb who will help you. Now he's saying, I made you Jewish. I made you a son of Abraham. I made you a descendant of Israel, of Jacob. I chose you from the womb, but I chose you also from the womb of Sarah, the wife of Abraham. He says, do not fear, Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. It's another term for Israel. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I don't want you to fear because I'm going to give you water. But now watch how he does this. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. He's not going to do it at this time. But he is promising them that their offspring, their descendants, their seed, their children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren, their heritage, their progeny is going to have the spirit of God poured out on them. 
Now, let's go back for one quick minute and let's look at Isaiah 42, which we studied this week. He's talking about his chosen one and he's talking about his servant. He's talking about Messiah. And what does he say? I have put my spirit on him. So God puts his spirit on the Messiah, on Mashiach, on Yeshua. He puts his spirit on him, and now he's going to put his spirit on his servants, on the Jews. He said, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up among the grass like poplars by a stream of water. No problem for them to grow and prosper. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. What's he saying? I'm the Lord's. I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. I want you to know that. I'm an Israelite. I belong to Abraham and Isaac and and Jacob. I am one of God's chosen ones. He goes on to say, and another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will name Israel's name with honor. He's going to name Israel's name with honor. Now, I want you to go back to Deuteronomy with me for just a minute. And I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Because remember, in Deuteronomy 28, we looked at the blessings for obedience, at the uh, curses for disobedience. And in verse 37 of Deuteronomy 28, when he's talking about them being scattered among the nations, he says, you shall become a whore. You shall become a proverb and a taunt among all the people. Jew, Jew, dirty Jew. It's anti-Semitism. It's hatred of God's chosen people. And because of that, they wanted to cover. They wanted to hide. They wanted to, to, to run away and say, no, no, no. And they went from city to city hiding because they were despised because of one simple thing. They were simply a Jew. But they didn't know that simply a Jew is not simply a Jew, but it is a chosen one by God. I may be wrong, but I think that someone that is Jewish is listening. And I want you to know, precious one, I am so sorry for anything that you have suffered for being one of God's chosen people. But I will tell you, the day is coming when you're going to be proud of being Jewish. You're going to be proud of belonging to the Lord. You are going to be proud of bearing the name Israel. Let's go back to chapter 44 of Isaiah. And this is what he says. He's going to pour out your spirit on the offspring. Now, when you hear that, If you've studied Joel and they don't know when Joel was written, they think Joel may have been written before Isaiah. They don't really, really have a timetable. But if you would go to Joel chapter two, and I would suggest that you simply write down next to this verse, Joel chapter two, and this is what you see. in Joel chapter two, verse 28. And it will come about after this that I will pour my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Well, who's the first one that he poured out his spirit on? Well, this is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And what is happening is... Uh, Peter is saying, listen, you're seeing the spirit poured out on these Jewish people from all over the world, speaking their many different dialects. He says, this is what was spoken of, Acts 2, 16, through the prophet Joel, and it shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. So first of all, it's poured out on the Jews. 
And then the Jews' rejection of Jesus as Messiah, it is poured out on the Gentiles. But there is a time when it's going to be poured out specifically on Israel. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. And I can't wait to study Jeremiah with you. And Ezekiel, I'm telling you, Jeremiah is so pertinent, so pertinent to our times. And so is Ezekiel, and it takes you into the future. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 24, he says, I will take you from the nations, talking to Israel, and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your heart flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit where within you. He's talking to the house of Israel. He's talking to the house of Judah. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You will be my people and I will will be your God. There's a day coming when they are going to rejoice. Yes, they're assigned to the band. Yes, they are for revilement right now, but that is going to change. So go back to Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, he has said it again, and his Redeemer, Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. There is no God besides me. He wants them to understand this. Why? Because they have turned to idols, because they have worshiped other gods, because they have gone into these countries. And just as he said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, when I scatter you, you're going to pick up their gods. I want to ask you a question. What gods have you picked up from the world? The God of materialism, the God of the bod, I mean, is your bod your God? What have you picked up? Is it your education? Is it, is it, is it you all about you? Is it self-worship? Is it, is it idolatry? Are you worshiping man or are you worshiping God? He says, there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it, yet... Yes, let him recount it to me in order. Is there anybody like God? That's a very important question. Have you put anybody before God? We'll talk about it in just a minute. And we'll tell you why the sticks are here. Do you desire to know what God's Word says? What a better place to come and study God's Word than where it actually happened. Whether you're a seasoned precept Bible study leader or a brand new student in God's Word, we'll meet you where you are and take you deeper into your journey in God's Word. Come with us and study God's Word where it happened. And not only to deepen your relationship with Jesus, but to deepen your relationship with others all around this world. I just liked watching, looking at the flow of what the author was saying and how everything um, fit and where it fit. and. Um, you know, asking the how and the what and the why questions, that was just, that just really, really helps put it all together and make, helps me understand it. And so I would go to my Bible and I'd read it and it'd be like, oh, thank you, Lord. You know, you showed me, you, you spoke to me and that sunk in and made it solid. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. realize that one of the things that affirms that God is God and there is no other is this book. This book that tells you what is going to come to pass from the beginning and brings to fulfillment. It is this book, which is the very words of God that tell you that God does nothing in secret, but what he reveals at first through his servants, his prophets. So as you look at this and as God is saying, okay, I want you to understand I'm God. 
I want you to understand that there is no God beside me. Verse 7 of Isaiah 44, who is like me? Let him proclaim it and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order. Tell me who's like me. From the time that I established the ancient nation, what ancient nation? If you don't have it by now, we're in trouble. That ancient nation is Israel. He says, and let them declare to them the things that are coming. He says, and the events that are going to take place. I mean, he has already told them that a child is going to be born, a son is going to be given, and that he's going to sit on the throne of David and of his kingdom, there's going to be no end. He is telling them about his servant that is going to come and how he is going to be a light to the nations so that they don't walk in darkness. He's told them all these things. He says, let them declare the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? Listen, whatever comes, I've already told you, you're going into Babylonian captivity. Don't sit there and tremble. Don't be afraid. Listen to me. Listen to my instructions. And he's going to give those instructions very clearly in Jeremiah. So he says, listen to my instructions. Do what I tell you. You don't have to worry. And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Is there any other rock See, the rock is that which does not move. The rock is that which cannot be moved. Is there any other rock? Is there any other God? He says, I know of none. Those who fashion a graven image, all of them are futile. And their precious things, this graven image, are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see and know so that they are put to shame. In other words, look. Here's a person who takes an idol, who fashions a God, who takes the knife and gets this God all formed. And there's no one that can witness for him because he has a mouth, but he cannot talk. Watch what he says. Who has fashioned an idol, a God, or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all of his companions will be put to shame. Everyone that's associated with this guy that's making the idol will be put to shame. Let them, because their craftsmen are mere men, they're not gods. So you have a man making a god that's not a god. He says, let them tremble, let them be put together uh, to shame. The man shapes into iron a cutting tool. In other words, he takes this iron and he forms it until he has a cutting a tool and does his work over the coals. He's shaping this metal in this hot coals, in this heat, and this is what it says. Fashioning it with hammers, working it with a strong arm, and he gets weary, and his strength fails. He drinks no water. This is the importance of water, and he gets weary. Here is a man that is making a tool that's going to carve a god and the man gets weary that's carving a God, a God that is supposed to speak to you, a God that is supposed to judge over you, a God that you are supposed to worship. Now watch what he says. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it in red chalk. And it says he works with planes. He outlines it with a compass. He takes that and he makes a compass of it. And then it goes and says he makes it in the form of a man. Well, kind of a sad looking man. And so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself. He takes a cypress, an oak, and raises it among the trees. So he goes out and he waters this tree. He's getting this tree to grow up. He's getting this tree to be strong. He's getting this tree so that what he can do is he can cut the wood off of the tree. He's going to make himself from that tree that he raised, that he watered, he's going to make for himself an idol. But before he makes the idol, what does he do with the wood? Look at what he does with the wood. It says, the rain makes the tree grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. 
So he takes some of them and warms himself. So he takes some of the wood and he makes a, a, a nice little fire to warm himself because he's cold. Oh, it feels so, so good. It's wonderful. And then I'm hungry. I'm hungry. So what am I going to do with my hunger? Well, I've got to roast meat. So I take more of the tree and I put it over here. I light the fire and I cook the food that I'm going to eat. But then I raise this tree so that I could make an idol. So he takes one batch of wood to warm himself, another batch of wood to roast his meat, and then he takes the third batch of wood to carve and to make his idol. And what does he do? Watch, it says, then it becomes something for a man to burn. He takes one of them, he warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls, uh, God you know, <laughs> and falls down before it. And he's worshiping this God. Oh God, help me. Oh God, I need rain. You just watered the tree yourself. Oh God, oh God, I need deliverance. Oh God, I'm afraid of you. You just carved it. You just carved it. You took part of the wood and you used it for baking bread and roasting meat. You took the other part of the wood and you warmed it. You got it off of a tree that you grew and now you've carved it and now you're bowing down to it. He says, but the rest of it, he makes a God, a graven image. He falls down and worships it. He prays to it, deliver me for you are my God. They do not know nor do they understand that he is smeared over his eyes so that he cannot see and their hearts so they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding that says, I've sinned. I have burned half of this in the fire. I have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and I eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. He cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? He's blind. And he says, remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You didn't form me. I, your God, formed you. You are my servant. O oh, Israel, O oh, Israel, O oh, Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. I'm taking care of your sin. Return to me. Return to me for I have redeemed you. Why are you here worshiping something you made with your own hands? Oh, precious one, return to me. Shout for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout joyfully, you lower pouts of the earth. Break forth into a shout of joy, you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and in Israel he has shown forth his glory. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. You have a Redeemer. Live for Him and know that an idol is only the imagination, the work of your hands. If somebody asks a question about anything, all we have to do is sit down with our Bibles and start looking maybe for some keywords and we can only come to the conclusions that are right there. Our opinions outside of that aren't as important. Like if me and scripture disagree, I change because there's so many misconceptions that I can have that aren't in scripture. Um, and it has helped me to know how to not just look at a verse by itself, but to look at the context to help me understand the meaning or to ask the five W's and H's as I'm going along. And um, just like who is, who is the audience that this author is talking about? Who is the author? Like, like knowing those things and knowing the historical background can really give you a lot of insight into what's going on in that book. 
Um, it's, I think that's really important to know and without having learned how to study, I, like I said, I would, I would be lost. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. Visit PreceptsForLife.com or call 1-800-763-1990. Well, beloved, have you looked at this idol that I have here on the table? And have you said, I am so thankful that I don't worship idols. It's pretty stupid, isn't it? They have eyes, but they can't see. They have a nose that never drips. Nobody blows it because there's no breath of life coming through it. They have lips, a mouth that cannot talk. If it goes any place, it has to be carried. If it falls over, it can't get up again. You have to put it up. I am so glad I don't worship, uh, worship idols. I don't know how people can do that. Oh, does an idol always look like that? Or is an idol something that takes the place of God? Is it something that you put before God? God says, you shall have no other gods before me. My name is Quana. My name is Jealous. And you're not to worship any other God. You say, I don't. I believe in the one true God. Well, let me ask you a question. How well are you worshiping him? I want to take you to the book of Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And I want to show you one verse. In Colossians chapter I want to show you two verses. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He's speaking to the believers. He's telling them to set their affections not on the things of earth, but set their affections on the things in heaven where Christ is seated. And he says, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Do you know what I believe the idol of America is? I believe it's greed. It's materialism. We just want more and more and more for ourselves. Do you know that we are ministering in 150 countries and in 70 languages, and they are crying for books? And how many books do we waste in this country? We keep buying more clothes for our back, more jewelry, more cars, more toys. It's idolatry. It's greed. Show me your checkbook. Show me what you do with your money, and I'll show you what your idol is. Or I'll show you that you are a true worshiper of God Almighty. You see, the idolater gives himself to creating the idol. And greed causes you to give yourself to materialism so you don't have time for God. Remember that. That's your precept for life today. Thank you for watching today. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life.